I am Rebecca Van Buren. I am a licensed real estate broker in the state of Texas, and I'm so excited to have attorney Samuel Reed talking to us today about getting your affairs in order. Stay tuned. All right, so everybody's always asking me about uh, real estate, and real estate is not about bricks and sticks. It's about people. Usually there's something really happy that's going on in your life. Maybe you're having a baby, maybe you just got married, but sometimes there's things that are happening that are sad. Possibly the death of a spouse, maybe even the death of a parent or a parent going into assisted living. So today we um, have the pleasure of being with my attorney and my friend, Sam Reed, and we're gonna talk about getting your affairs in order. So Sam, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, here, Rebecca, I'm glad to be here. First off, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, I have an engineering degree from Texas A&M. What? And my Juris Doctorate. Oh, thank you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, and my Juris Doctorate from Baylor Law, so I'm trying to hit two major Texas. <laughs> you got fair country and college station. Yeah, yeah. College station, yeah. Uh, and then I've been practicing here in Granbury with my father at the Reed Firm for almost six years now. And we just finished our addition to part of our building that the law firm said now. And so if anyone comes by, we look forward to seeing you in our new addition. Okay, so let's talk about the difference between a last will and testament versus a trust. Yeah, that's a great question. I get that question a lot, you know, should I use a will? Should I use a trust? Um, and so let me start by, let's just talk about what a trust is. Cause okay. a lot of people ask me what a trust is. And so the example I like to use is, that's kind of like asking me, what a, what is a contract? You know, what is a contract? A contract can be a lot of things. Really it's an agreement between two people to do something. Okay. And that can be a two page agreement with your neighbor to mow the lawn, or that can be an a hundred page agreement to do some sort of complicated stock exchange or something, right? Um, same thing with the trust. A trust is really an agreement between three people. That's all it is at a simple level. Um, it's an agreement between the trustor who owns the property. Um, it's an agreement with him and the trustee who is going to take that property and manage it for the benefit of someone. And then that third party is the beneficiary who's the person that's going to receive that benefit. Okay. And so at a very simple level, that's all that trust is. And so from there, we could use a trust for a variety of purposes. People use it for tax planning. They use it to take care of property for someone else who we either don't want to take care of it or is unable to take care of it. Um, or we use it for estate planning purposes to make sure the property goes to the people it's supposed to go to when we pass. And so that's really what a trust is at a 10,000 foot view. On the other hand, we have the last will and testament, which is a will. I'm sure we're all familiar with that. But, you know, and Can you run it on a napkin? You can't. Okay. <laughs> Legally in Texas, you can. Uh, so I don't recommend that. So we have, in a sense, two kinds of wills in Texas. So okay. to your point on the napkin, we have what's called a holographic will. And so if you identify something as your last will and testament in your own handwriting and you signed it, um, that's a valid will in Texas. That's all it takes. Now, there can be a lot of issues that come up because of that, but it's technically a valid will. Okay. Um, on the other hand... Um, we have what people are used to seeing in a will, and that requires you have two witnesses who are at least 14 years of age or older, and you have to sign it in their presence, and they have to sign. And then usually we like to see what's called a self-proving affidavit on the back. And so all three of you sign that again, and then that's stamped by a notary, and that simplifies the court proceedings. And we'll talk about the court proceedings in a second. That's called probate. But the last one, testament, is just a simple document that says what happens to your stuff when you pass. And we put someone called the executor in charge of managing that process, um, and that's a last will, a testament, in a nutshell. What's the difference between a living will and a last will? Is there a difference? Yeah, so a living will is really what we call a directive to physician. Uh, and so that's more focused on, you know, what happens if you're unable to make health care decisions for yourself. Okay. Generally, we fill out that document. Most people focus on the ones I normally create or, you know, if a physician determines you're terminally ill and you're going to pass within six months or less. It instructs him to withhold life-sustaining treatment, keep you comfortable as you pass. In other words, you don't want to be kept in a vegetative state. Yeah, I definitely don't want to be kept in a vegetative state. Right, Yeah, and just racking up bills for your family when you're yeah. ever kind of slobbering on myself. That is not fun. But I remember you set that up for our family because we had the whole package of whatever we did um, when we set up, uh, when we tried to get our financial house in order, or our yeah. uh, not even just our financial house, but just getting ourselves in order. So, and let me ask you, I hear this all the time in real estate. I can't tell you how many times someone will say, it's okay, um, I can handle all my dad's stuff. I have power of attorney. I can sell his house. What is power of attorney? How can you use it? And who can use a power of attorney to sell real estate? Yeah, great question. So power of attorney is a general statement 
can be a lot of different things once again. Now we're used to seeing it in two forms and that's usually the business power of attorney or statutory durable power of attorney, people call it, or the medical power of attorney. But really a power of attorney at its heart is once again, it's an agreement between two people. Um, and a lot of times we'll refer to the initial person as the principal. And I sign an agreement that lets someone else act on my behalf as my agent or attorney, in fact, are the two terms that are used interchangeably there. And so I can say, I can have a very specific one. I can say, Rebecca, you can act as my agent and I'm going to let you go and get groceries for me. And you can spend my money at the grocery store and you bring the groceries back. Just super simple. Okay. But a lot of times where we use it, especially in the estate planning context, is we'll use that statutory rule power of attorney. Um, and so let's break that down real quick. So the statutory part is there's kind of a general form set out by a statute and, um, and attorneys, we kind of modify that in our own words a little bit, but that's the statutory part. And the durable part, which is really important for estate planning purposes, means that it lasts beyond the incapacity of the individual. So in English, power of attorney, you can only use that if you're alive or someone can only be a power of attorney if you're alive. Because if you die, the power of attorney dies with you. Is that right? That is right. But the, the durable part specifically is referring to incapacity. So by default, if you became incapacitated, I can't use your power of attorney anymore. Okay. On the statutory durable power of attorney, we have language that says, even if you become incapacitated, I can still act for you. So that's the one to get. You really want to have the durable power of attorney, not just a power of attorney. Yes. And, and to your point, though, all powers of attorney are void at death. And so they will no longer work once the agent, not the agent, once the principal is deceased. So you can't, if you have a power of attorney of your dad and you're hoping to sell his real estate and he passes, that power of attorney is no longer going to work. Even if it's durable power of attorney. Even if it's durable. The durable is referring to that incapacitated state, not to whether they are deceased. Deceased or not. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't understand that. Yeah. I, I, I We get questions on that a lot. Another one that comes up less often but does come up is if you get guardianship over someone, the power of attorney is also would. It stops working when there's a guardianship. Oh, wow. And a guardianship would be in a case where your uh, parent has Alzheimer's or dementia and you're having to make decisions for them. Yeah, that's so. are in the case of a minor, too. Um, we can oh. have it with a minor. So legally, a minor is considered an incapacitated individual. And just like I agree with them. dementia. Or something. <laughs> he read it. The frontal lobe isn't even developed till 25 or something. Right, right. right. <laughs> well, they may only have to wait till 18. Oh, okay. Well, okay, cool. Tell me, um, what is the difference between a transfer on debt deed and the late? Ladyberg. Sure. So the transfer on debt deed is something that's relatively new. I think that that was created by the legislature 2016, I think. Make, no, 2018. Okay. Don't quote me on that though, but I think it was 2018. Um, and the transfer on debt deed is unique because at common law, it breaks the rules that are required of wills. That's why there had to be a statute that created it, or not wills. It breaks the rules on what's required of a deed. Uh, and that's why we had to have a special statute creating it. So okay. a transfer on death deed can be a great way to pass on your property to whoever you want it to go to at death. Um, and so the way it works is you have to sign it presently, say who the property is to go to, and then you file it of the real record in the real records. There's no transfer at that time. Um, and if you sell the property or revoke the transfer on death deed, it goes away. Um, but if you pass while it's in place, then the individual or individuals who it passes to all they have to do is show up to the appraisal district with a death certificate and they'll switch the tax rolls over. Um, there's nothing else to do. Um, the deeds, it automatically goes into their name as a function of law. It's really just switching the tax records. Do you have to, what if you have a mortgage? Can you still have a transfer on death deed even if you have a mortgage? Yep. It just passes subject to the mortgage. In the same way that a piece of property can pass through a will to someone, um, it passes subject to the secured debt that's on it. Uh, one thing to watch out for on the transfer on death deed is that a power you cannot sign it and transfer on death deed with a power of attorney. Um, the statute specifically says that's void. Um, and so, you know, if you sign a transfer on death deed for dad using his power of attorney, file it of record, and he passes that deed's void. It's not usable, so it did not transfer the property. Okay. On the other hand, we have the ladybird deed, and these two are often used to accomplish the same thing. The ladybird deed we'll see a little bit more in asset protection standpoint, specifically for Medicaid. Okay. Um, Medicaid has a five-year clawback look-back provision where they look back at the last five years at your assets to see if you qualified. And so 
if you do that ladybird deed and then wait five years before applying for medicaid they will consider that property in your estate now so let's talk about what a ladybird de deed is real quick it's named after ladybird johnson um, that's where the name comes from and she didn't actually use one i don't think but it was a famous hypothetical a law school professor used it mm -hmm. used ladybird johnson it but regardless um what it is is it's really uh, some people have heard of a life estate deed and so the person who owns the property is reserving a life estate, which means they have the right to live there for the rest of their life and to utilize the property generally. Mm -hmm. And they're giving it future interest to someone else. Okay. Um, and which means that when they pass, it automatically transfers to that person. Um, the thing that's different about a Lady Bird than just a life estate is that you also reserve the power to sell the property, to mortgage it, to refinance it, all of those things. And so if you sell the property after doing a Lady Bird it wipes out the future interest of the people that you gave it to and okay. so it kind of has the same effect as a transfer on debt deed except a lady bird deed can be signed with the power of attorney okay. um, and it is considered a present conveyance which once again can come into play with that medicare look back provision because you've conveyed a majority of the property out of your estate presently at least i understand all that future interest so tell me about um probate who who has to go through probate and or what what is probate yeah great question so Probate, real simply, is just the legal process where a will is authenticated. And so a last will and testament does nothing if it's not probated. Okay. Do you have a time frame to do this in? You do. You have four years from the date of death of the individual whose okay. will you're trying to probate. Um, and what the probate process is, very simply, is an application is filed with the court um, with the original will. Um, and then whoever's name is the executor has to show up to a hearing. Um, and at that hearing, they prove up the will. They testify to certain facts that authenticates the validity of the will. And then they get a court order that says that, that says the last will of the decedent um, and issued what's called a letter testamentary. And that letter testamentary is really a court document that says, you know, Rebecca Van Buren is the executor of Sam's estate, and so she has the authority to deal with any party that has property that belongs to Sam's estate. Okay. And so uh, without probate, the will doesn't work, um, but once it's probated, uh, then the executor can go about to handle the affairs. They're going to be tasked with gathering all the assets, paying any debts of the estate, um, not secured creditors, but just the other debts, and then they'll transfer the property subject to the secured creditor debts to the beneficiaries under the will. One thing to note, I get this a lot, people are wanting to say, you know, I, I want to avoid probate. I don't want to go through probate. Well, that, that really comes from, there's kind of a boutique trust industry that kind of started in California and worked its way east. Uh, and if you were in California, I would say, absolutely, we need to get a trust. We're going to avoid probate. Uh, we don't want to go through the probate process because you don't need to probate a trust. A trust is going to transfer at death, no probate necessary. Okay. Um, but in Texas, I'm going to disagree a little bit, um, especially in our area. So the Hood County area, it's going to take about one to two months to have that hearing on the will. So After the person dies, you've, you've gone and you've filed for uh, probate. Correct. And yeah. then it's going to take one to two months after that. To have that hearing. Yeah. Oh, to have the hearing. To have the hearing. Okay. And then after you have that hearing, you get appointed as executor. At that point, you can manage the property how you need to. So a lot of times on the real estate transaction side, people are needing to get that authority to sell the real estate. So after that hearing, that, you know, one to two months, then we have the authority to sell the property at that point, generally speaking. And yeah. so not a long process. It's not a terribly expensive process in Hood County. And um, average, I see it about $3,500. Um, and so we're looking about for attorney costs, not for court costs. Well, both. Okay. Yeah, Just together. together. Yeah. I understand. Okay. Um, what if you don't have a will? Do you still have to go to probate? Well, so probate is specifically referring to proving up the will. Yes. Um, so if we don't have a will and we need to sell real estate, for example, and there wasn't anything that conveyed that or took care of it, we have to do what's called a dependent administration. And so with that process, you have to file with the court and say, you know, the deceased individual didn't have a will. Is that intestate? That is intestate. Yeah, so intestate, you have a will, intestate, there's no will. Yes. Um, and so you have to file, you have to say the individual's intestate, they had no will, and then you have to get appointed as the administrator. Um, this process is much, much longer. Ooh. Um, it's much more expensive because you have to have a court order on every single piece. You have to report to the court on every asset. You have to say, court, you know, I'm going to sell the real property now. Do I have permission to do that? Okay, here's my contract. Do you approve of that? Is that fair market value? You have to go through this whole process. So very important to have a will yeah. for that reason. And because uh, the statutory law that controls what happens to your property, who gets it if you don't have a will, oftentimes can be a different result than the person wanted. 
Mm. Um, for mm. example, you know, because you haven't stated what you want to have happen with your stuff, right? Yeah. And so if we have what you know, a nuclear family situation, we have mom, dad, and two kids from the marriage, and that's it. If dad passes, mom gets everything. Mm-hmm. But if we have mom and dad and two kids of that marriage, it dad's two kids from previous marriage and dad passes mom just keeps her half of the property that she already owned and the other half goes to all four of the kids that's when you get into i own one sixth of this and yeah exactly it gets very complicated yeah it can um so like that... all my transactions but sam and i do a lot of probate work together and it just seems like if it's complicated i end up with it which is great you you know you want to have someone that specializes in and, uh, you know, working in these type of cases that I don't have all the answers, but at least I know where to go to get the answers. Well, we're always happy to do it. I, I love digging into those things. Yeah, it's fun. Enjoy. It's yeah, it's interesting. I, I agree. I agree. What else um, is something that um, we should know to get our affairs in order? So really the two other things I would really hit on there are uh, back to the powers of attorney. For, I'll say three things. You need a medical power of attorney. So under... Texas law or law at default, you can't just make medical decisions for your spouse if they're unable to. Um, okay. Now, sometimes I'll have people say, well, you know, I just did that the other day at the hospital. Sometimes medical staff will work with you and they'll choose to honor those decisions, but legally they're not obligated to. Um, not only your spouse, but your 18-year-old child. Yeah. And it, yeah. Well, I get it a lot on the spouse because people think I could make yeah. a decision with myself. But yeah, for anyone that you want a power of attorney over, yeah, and you can't make their medical decisions for them. Right. Once yeah, Minors are different, but once they're an adult. Yeah. Um, so excellent point on the 18-year-old child. Um, well, she's now 21, but, yeah, but, I, I, but I can't make any decisions, yeah, you know, without right. having... Now, without her permission or having a medical power of attorney. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so that's very important, just to be able to make medical decisions for someone who can't... Um, I recommend everyone have a medical power of attorney in place with at least, I like to go two agents deep, but at least, you know, one or two agents that can make those decisions for you if you're unable to. Agents meaning uh, the person that you select to make the decisions and carry out what you what you want, the, yes. what an agent is. Yes, yeah, the person that you would invest with that authority. Yes. To make those decisions for you. From there, uh, a will only governs what we call probate assets and a trust only governs the assets that are in the trust. And so what I always recommend everyone do is look at their beneficiary designations. So let's take your IRA account. That's not going to pass through the will if there's beneficiaries on it. Just bypass the string to over there. Just goes straight to the beneficiaries. Yeah. A lot of times those non-probate assets are contractual in nature. So life insurance policies, IRAs. Savings accounts. When you set all that up and you're filling it out, you really don't know what you're writing down. Yeah. Even in savings or checking accounts, yeah. if they have a beneficiary or a lot of times if you're married, you get what's called a joint account with rights of survivorship, which yep. means that. If the two of you own it, it's going to go straight to that survivor when you pass. And so those won't pass through the will. They'll go based on those designations. And so I recommend everyone always look at all those accounts and see what those designations are. Because, you know, if I said in the will, I want my IRA, IRA to be split three ways between my kids, my hypothetical kids here. Yeah. Um, and the IRA says, no, it's going all to Rebecca. Well, guess what? It's going all to Rebecca. It's not going three ways to the kids, even though that's what the will said. Because it's going to go based on that beneficiary designation. Yep. And then the last one is just keep a list of everything you have, your passwords, your important information, and make sure, you know, one or two trusted people have that so they know where they can find those documents. They have, you have your safe password that all those documents are kept in. Yeah. They have, you have someone that has authority to access that safe deposit box at the bank to get those documents. You know, keep all that information together because that's really going to help people if something happens to you. Um, All the time, you know, I have clients and someone will pass and, you know, Everyone loved them. They may have had everything in order, but, you know, their kids don't know where they kept everything. It's yeah. this, this hunt and this waiting period, and we're trying to figure out, you know, did this dog mix exist? Where is it? It's so good to have a clear mind when you're trying to prepare these things and get them done prior to when you have to have them. Yeah, that's a great point, Rebecca. And that's that's why I recommend everyone. Really, the reason I do what I do and I'm in this industry is my desire, when someone passes, that warning process is what you should be focused on and taking care of them and being with family. Um, and so the last thing I want people to be doing is worrying about attorneys and complicated issues and things like that. And so I think I recommend you get have things done in advance and um, can make things much simpler on the back end. And that way, that's not something that you're having to worry about when, that, when the inevitable happens, unfortunately. 
All right, as always, thank you so much for watching my YouTube channel. Thank you to Sam Reed for helping us have a clear path of what some of our next steps are. Please click subscribe. We post new videos every single week and stay tuned to see what's up next.